and hopefully the weather is nice enough to be outside for that. So uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. But you want, want you to pray that that all comes together well. Otherwise, please, 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 please look at the information in the bulletin. Take note of those things. We've got some great music for you this morning. And uh, we know sometimes the temperature in here is not what you like it to be. We're trying to control it. But you get a bunch of you in here and everybody, uh, if you would quit breathing, it wouldn't be so hot, okay? But it raises the temperature real quick, three or four degrees. So we're just going to do what we can. And uh, we ask that you would uh, join with us now as Jeremy and company lead us in worship. Uh, we're not even going to stand up and say hello. You can do that afterwards today. Let's pray. Let's, yeah, we're not going to even try that. Let, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for our opportunity to share the, the service together. Lord, you know our needs today. You know how the service and the, the music will touch us, how the word of God is open to us. We pray that you'd bless us as we as we partake together and rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We commit the hour to you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. you to stand with me. You know, as we worship, I want you to feel comfortable. I want you to stand, sit, clap, snap, whistle, hum, whatever that is. We're here to worship. Amen. Today, we remember that because of Jesus' victory over death, we have been called out of death and into life. Till I met you 
needed rescue My sin was heavy But chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan You called me a citizen of heaven First, first part of verse 3 says, To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning. That's what we sing about today. The song says, You turn mourning to dancing, you give beauty from ashes and shame into glory. He's turning it all on its head, right? That's what we're all about today. Let's sing that together. Seeds into high. 
heaven will be able to join with the angels, the saints who have gone before us, everyone, and just lift up our voices in eternal worship to God. And I don't know about you, but I, I am looking forward to that. And that's this next song reminds us of that future, right? When we will be singing and lifting our voices with a thousand generations in unison, praising God. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the
Isaiah 61, 2 says, He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it, the day of the, God's anger against their enemies. May we hear that, the time of the Lord's favor has come. We remember today, not just because of what happened on Friday, but the joy of his resurrection, the joy of his peace that we have.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. Let's go to God in prayer. God, today, we praise you because the Lamb is overcome. God, we know that the only reason we're here is because of what happened that day so many years ago. So that is what we're here to celebrate. We celebrate the death and the resurrection, the victory over death, the fact that death has lost its sting because our resurrected King has defeated it. God, let us, let us not forget that. We lift this up to you, and we pray this in our risen Savior's name, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. So Isaiah uh, 61, first half of verse 3, says, In the righteousness they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. And I, I want to I wanna point that out. And, and the kids are going, I don't think there's any way we're calling them back, so you guys can go. But uh, um, just got a song here that just kind of goes along with that, with what Monty's talking about today, the verses that he's using, the fact that God is going to grow us. And all that he requires is just that little seed of faith, right? That's all he requires. He, he'll take care of everything else. And so that's what this song is about. Story when it rains, when it rains. 
God, in prayer one more time. God, today we thank you that you are growing us. We thank you that you are here. We thank you for your son, his death and his resurrection and what that means for us. God, just remind us today that you are taking, you are taking the old and making it new. You're, you're taking the ashes and giving us beauty. God, today, as we learn, as we hear from you, I ask that you would speak through Pastor Monty that, that your words would reach us, that your words would teach us, that your words would grow us. I give you this time, I ask that you would bless it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, praise team. Thank you. Happy Resurrection Sunday, church. How are you? It's good to see you today. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for those of you tuning in as well. Just are so grateful for this time. What an amazing, amazing day. I love this day. How many love our celebration on Resurrection Sunday? Isn't that good? Yeah, give God a hand clap for that. I tell you, growing up as a kid, you know, now married, having my own children, I kind of look at this, uh, you know, Easter was always a, a holiday that was always looked forward to, time to celebrate together, you know, something that we enjoyed. You know, you get dressed up and... Everybody comes to church, and you come as a family, and then, of course, the afternoon dinners, all those things that are waiting for us, the candy, the hard-boiled eggs that you get to eat from now and for the next month, right? And, uh, of course, who could forget all those absolutely wonderful, sugar-coated, multicolored, marshmallowy goodness called Peeps. Come on now, right? Come on. How many like Peeps? Come on. How many like Peeps? Oh, come on. They're so amazing. You kidding me? And, and you can't be a noob about it either. You got to be a professional. When you get your pack, you pop a little hole, you let them dry out a little bit, you know what I'm saying, for a couple of days. You guys are looking at me like I'm weird. I'm telling you, it's good. It's, best, it's the best stuff ever. I like putting you in the microwave so maybe it will cook. Amen to that. I like that. See, someone representing. Thank you. Love it. That's awesome. <laughs> You know, when you're young, when you're young, uh, obviously most of uh, the focus on Easter is the eggs, the candy, and the, and the green-filled baskets and family times in the morning. You know, for me, it wasn't until I became a teenager that uh, I really leaned in, and I really began to listen as to what Resurrection Sunday was all about, the celebration, what it really meant. It was, it's, it's about a loving, heavenly Father who loves us so much, God Almighty, that by his own free will and volition, that he sent his one and absolute only son to come born of a woman into his creation, that he came intentionally, he came specifically, and he came with purpose. Nothing about it accidental. And in coming into his creation... He took the full weight. He took every bit of the full burden and the full wrath and every bit of it of the guilt and of the shame of mankind's sin and disobedience before an absolute beautiful and holy God. So at age 15, I came to Christ. That's when I gave my life to Jesus. I'm so grateful for that day. The day that changed me and began to change me, I, I started to learn, I started to grow in a hunger for God and his word. And, and it wasn't until I turned 17 that really God began to show me, teach me what the deeper things of him, the significance, the blessing, the, the sorrow which gave sin and shame and guilt a place to be looked at and given to Jesus, a place for healing, a place for restoration and reconciliation with God and with man. You know, something that God revealed to me then, and that has even stuck with me even till today, is that sin, when sin is allowed to rule and just run wild 
in our lives and unconfessed, it has a devastating power to wreck us, to bring hardship, to bring destruction, to bring devastation within our lives. And it affects us physically and spiritually and emotionally and relationally when it's allowed to run in our lives. This is what floors me about Jesus. This is what absolutely undoes me internally as he continues to deepen my understanding of him, especially in this, this way of understanding who he is. I mean, who he really is and what he's really done and who we are truly in him. Big idea of today is this. God sees our spiritual need. He sees every aspect of us. There is nothing about you or me that is hidden from him. Nothing. He knows every bit of what's going on in you. Everything that you struggle with. Everything that's holding you back. And you know what God knows? He knows that... You, me, mankind in general, we are incapable, incapable to change or to heal or to be forgiven or to be restored, any of that apart from him. It can't happen. He's the one that has stepped in. He is the one that has showed up for you and for me. Apart from him, we can't accomplish any of that. We need him in our lives because he is the one who meets every single need that you and I possess. It's all in him. And what is it that we need? We need peace with God. We need forgiveness from sin. We need release. That only happens in him. You talk about such a great example, a huge example of his great love, true beauty for ashes. See, sin, sin's what separated us from God from the beginning. Sin started in the garden. And in the garden, it was meant for paradise, but it ended up becoming a place that no longer was man able to dwell. We, we, we lost that. The moment that Adam and Eve took a bite, it was done, done right there. And from the garden debacle to present day, Jesus, our savior is here and he is here to heal the damage that sin has done. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 reminds us of this and it says, but when the fullness of of the time came, that is at the exact moment that God himself chose before the foundation of the world was even laid, he knew the appointed time that would be the perfect time, the fulfillment of time. It would be the moment for him to come. And in that fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters to be brought into his family, to to be reconciled so so that sin no longer separates, but to come into faith into him and to experience a relationship that's like absolutely no other on this side of heaven. He did that. At the exact time. It wasn't a second early and it wasn't a second late. It was the time, the exact moment to redeem us. What's that word mean? To purchase us, to to ransom us, to, to, to pay the debt in full that you and I could not pay. He paid with his own life took the place that you and I should be. 
He did that to adopt us. It blows my mind. To adopt us through faith by grace that we're able to come into that relationship. Ephesians tells us, for by grace you have been saved. How? Through faith. The realization that, God, I can't do this life without you in me. I can't. For me, that revelation was at 15. I pray and trust your revelation has already come. If you're here today and it hasn't come, may this be the day that it comes. God has a plan. And his plan is to redeem you and me. You know what's amazing about this? All of this was motivated by God's love. God's love for us. Jesus' love for us. John 3, 16, what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him, receive him, not just have the intellectual understanding, but enter into a living, breathing relationship with him. It says, you shall never perish if you come into that kind of relationship. And what a joy that is. God's love is why Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross for all of man's sin, both past, present, and future. And our celebration today, well, what are we celebrating today? It's to be ever so grateful for all that Jesus has done in going to the cross. We're here to celebrate that, to lift our voice, to say, God, we thank you, we love you, we praise you. We are honored, we're humbled. That he went to the cross for me, for you, for all of us. You know what's amazing is that our sin sent Jesus to the cross. Do you know that it's his love that kept him there? His love is why he finished it. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says this, there is one mediator in God who can reconcile God and humanity. It's the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And this is the message that God gave to the world at just the right time. Jesus is our only mediator. He's the only one who can reconcile us to God Almighty. He came with purpose. He came with intention. He came with a plan to fulfill. And it's something that only what he could do, knowing exactly what we need, And knowing exactly where we are. And so it reminds us of just why Jesus came. And so may our hearts be ready. Isaiah is going to tell us a little bit about that today. We've already sang a little bit about that today. But we need to be prepared. God has something for you today. You specifically. You are here. He wants you to walk away and exiting these doors with something he wants to give you today. We got to be tuned in. So will you join me? Let's pray. Let's ask God. Let's, let's, Let's be ready to receive what he has for us. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We know, Lord, that your word is is, is anointed and it's filled with your spirit. And Father, that it's living and active. It's able to, to completely divide us and open us up and expose the inner part of our being. Father, we need you today to speak to us. Father, share with us, reveal to us who you are. God, what you've done for us and who we are in you. God, we're so grateful and we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 61. That's where we're going to be today. We're going to look at verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. If you didn't bring a Bible, should be one in front of you in the seat underneath you. Definitely encourage you to grab one. Isaiah 61. It's page 892 in my Bible. I don't know about you, but whatever. Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to look at verse 1 and the very beginning of verse 2. Chapter 
Church, may we hear what the word of the Lord is. Here it is. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. See, Isaiah the prophet here wrote those words in a prophetic word here, pointing to Christ when one day would come. It was was a future look. The prophets would put this out. They longed for the fulfillment. And they they were looking down the corridor of time, knowing that there would be a Savior that would come, knowing that Jesus the Messiah would come. The Savior for mankind, the one who would heal the devastation that sin has caused, and the only one that Jesus himself could do on our behalf. The prophets longed for it. They did. They wanted the fulfillment. They, they could, <laughs> they wanted to see it, but they knew it wasn't going to be in their time. It was going to be in God's time and God's time only. Isaiah begins here. He, he begins by revealing what is, in, in terms of Christ and how, how in all of this, What in Christ enables and empowers all that his ministry was here to accomplish on behalf of man. In fact, notice the verse one here says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now, Isaiah proclaims here, he's saying basically the Messiah would have upon him the very spirit of God. That would be what would be the guiding and the empowering and the leading and ultimately utilizing for God's, the Father's glory. And this anointing, this anointing that came upon him, that enabled him, that Jesus for the ministry that lied ahead, uh, to anoint means what? It means really it was a, it was a setting apart. It was a, it was a process of God's selection for his special use. And this was common. This wasn't an uncommon thing. In fact, we see it contained in the pages of scripture elsewhere for those who were called to a unique or maybe a special service for for God. Uh, Think about King Saul. Think about King David. And, And now we find King Jesus being anointed in this way. Same thing, selected, ordained use. And it's the language and it's the imagery that's here to be filled and be blessed by the Holy Spirit, it's upon individual and what service that they would do. Now, something that pops out, something that I observe in this is this, the rest of these verses that we're about to read share what Christ did in being sensitive to our spiritual needs in light of sin and its devastation, but yet for any of those needs to be met, nothing would happen without the spiritual supernatural movement of God by way of the Holy Spirit that was engaged and was activated and was through that anointing. Now we know, we know that Christ stepped into it and into its fulfillment with the cross on Calvary that culminated in him walking out of that tomb. See, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do you and me? How much more do we need him? I don't know about you, but I'm incapable to live this life in him without him. Anybody here mess it up uh, with me if we do our own thing? Come on. It's only when his spirit's alive in you and in me and when he's engaging and activated do we see our lives change. Do we experience him in a different way? The truth is, is it's supernatural significance. It's impossible without being filled, without being anointed by God. And we all have got to come to a place where we got to submit humbly to it. And we need to seek it and we need to protect it and let God have all of who we are in our lives. We have to yield ourselves to him in every way. So, so what is God's present favor? What is it then? 
or his blessing in which we live currently in, if we're in him by faith, what, what, what is that favor that we experience now? Okay, because sin's devastation and damage has wounded so many, it's further compounding its effects upon us all. So what is this? What is his present favor? Well, you know what's interesting? This is just a cool little gem. I love this. This <laughs> Christ ministry was confirmed, okay, utilizing this passage, and we read about it in Luke chapter 4. How cool is this? Jesus, in the, his ministry, comes to the synagogue. He goes inside, and the attendant, he, he walks up front, he was respected, so he walks up front. The attendant hands him the scrolls. The scrolls that he happens to give happen to be, just happen to be, Isaiah. Jesus takes the scrolls, opens them up, and begins to read from this passage, the very passage that we just looked at. I love this. Luke 4, 21, and at the conclusion, he, he reads verse 1 and the very first part of verse 2, then he folds it up, hands it back to the attendant, and goes and takes a seat, and then says these words. And he, that is Christ, began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What? What? How crazy would that be? This passage that we just looked at. Jesus said, yep, guess what? Fulfilled it today. You heard it right here live in front of you. Culminating this. I mean, what an amazing thing. Guzik, uh, a commentator, like says this. The Savior's here to heal the damage that sin brings. So what is the damage? Let's look at it, and then I'm gonna read the list that Guzik speaks of. He says what? He says, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted or the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So what is the damage that sin brings? Here's the damage. Sin impoverishes us. It makes us poor, poor in spirit. I mean, poor in life. It just, it wrecks us this way. But he says, you know what? No, listen, I, I, I've come to bring good news to you. News that, that lifts your spirits, that, that has a way of picking you up. A, a way that's, it's going to elevate your eyes off of this life and give you the hope of the life to come. I mean, that's incredible. Sin, what does it do? It breaks hearts. It breaks hearts, shatters hearts. He says, I have come, I've come to bring healing to those who are brokenhearted, to bind them together, to, to knit them and put them back together, to make that heart whole. Sin makes captives and slaves to unrighteousness. He says, I've come to declare and release freedom, freedom to the captive. That is to a person or to opening prisons. That's to a place. See, sin, what does it do? It oppresses. Anyone here tired of the weight that sin just wreaks on this world that we deal with? It's annoying. That's so why I say, come, Jesus, come. Let's get this, let's, let's get going here, you're right? That's where I'm at. Sin oppresses, but Christ has declared what? He says, it's the favorable year of the Lord. It's acceptable today. Because why? I'm with you. I'm here with you. I haven't left you. I haven't abandoned you. I love you, and I'm with you. It's time for us to think through this. Get, get just a little curious internally. And I want to ask you some of these questions and I want you to think about it. I want you to meditate on it and just kind of ruminate on this for just a moment. Where are you right now, right here? Where, where are you? Where are you at in life? In light of what sin does and what Christ has done for us. Are you here today and are you feeling empty? Are you feeling drained 
Are you feeling overwhelmed or afflicted? What and who are you listening to? Are you listening to the world? Are you listening to yourself? I mean, wh- where are you going to that's aiding you in these feelings of being empty and drained and overwhelmed and afflicted? See, the only message, the only message of hope and peace and strength and joy that comes from the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior, as Lord, and as friend. Whatever you're going through, God says, I have hope for you. I have peace for you. I have joy for you. You say, well, I don't see it. I don't know how. Well, I tell you, you got to bring it to him. You got to take what's going on in you and present it to him and say, God, I can't do this. I can't do it. I need you. Do you think God's going to go, eh, now you're a hot mess? Is is he going to do that? No, he's not going to do that. (laughs) Not at all. Kind of picture him just picking you up and kind of putting you on his knee and and you and him start to have a conversation about it. Because he wants to speak to you about it. He He wants to undo that from you. He doesn't want you to go through this life heavy, burdened. He wants you free. He wants you to experience joy. It doesn't mean you're not going to have hardships and things that are going to attack that. But you don't have to let it stick. You don't have to carry it around like a backpack. You're slinging it. You can, you can give it to him. And, and he will help you through it. And that's a beautiful thing. Where you say, well, I, I don't know. Well, I'm, I, you don't know because you haven't tried. I'm telling you, it happens. God wants to take that from you. And he wants to help guide you through. Do you have hurts right now? Or, or do you feel like you're carrying them alone? What's going on in this? Do you, do you, are you having a death in silence slowly? Is, is it just weighing you down? Has there been disappointment with God? Are, are you mad at him? Are you struggling with him or loved ones or others or things that's broken your heart or unsure and unsure if we can ever heal? Is, is, it, is it just you carry this with you? Heavy again with this? Christ said, listen, I came to bind that heart, to, to put that heart together, to make it whole. And it's only in him. Only in him we have healing and release and forgiveness as it possible. But here's the caveat, you've got to bring it all to him. You can't hold some of it back. You can't cradle it. You got to let it go. You got to put it in his hands and let him walk you through it. Do you feel captive? Do you feel captive to your struggles, your hardships, your addictions? Captive in this way? Are, are you in bondage? Is there a person in your life that's toxic, abusive? Is, it, is there things that are going on with that? And it just feels like, oh my goodness, or... or or in prison of some sort, like the bondage to a place. Maybe it's your place in life or, or, or a direction that you're going or, or don't having. I don't know. See, only in Christ is there freedom. Only in Christ is there freedom to overcome and be set free from everything that binds you. If it's a people or a place, whatever, as God guides and as he protects you and navigates the release, You learn to trust him more versus yourself or others or voices that you allow. You learn to trust him better. So do you feel, do you feel like there's no hope, no hope of life ever changing or getting better than your current situation? Is this like the pinnacle? Is this it? I I tell you that Jesus has declared something that he He's here, and he's here to be your everything. He wants first place in your life, and he wants to be your everything. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you, but with you through everything that you face, he will continue to do his work to prepare you for what's to come. And you won't be doing it alone. He'll be walking through in each and every way. See, a truth about this is that our Savior is here and present. He is not absent. He cares for all things concerning you. 
Church, he cares for you individually, you. You matter to him. When, when he sees you, it, it gives a smile on his face because you reflect his image and he sees what he's made in you. When's the last time that you've heard that Jesus cares for you, that he loves you? I hope you internalize that. That's a game changer. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you don't let it be something that just hits you in the head and doesn't go any further, it's a game changer. His love is what sent him to the cross so as to redeem us from the curse of the law and sin and death and that apart from a relationship with him through faith, we know we are incapable to satisfy with our holy God on our own. We can't do it. It's only Jesus himself that satisfies everything for us. So yes, yes, our present favor is our savior Jesus working in our lives, loving on us, guiding us, healing us, setting us free from all that holds us back and, and anything that, that holds us down. And he is wanting to restore hope. He's wanting to restore joy. He's wanting to restore peace. And I'm telling you, church, there's nothing like it when you allow God's spirit to set you free. I can't thank God enough for what he's doing in me. And I give him praise and I give him glory and I give him honor. And I am not special. Just like you, he loves you just as much as he loves me. And I'm telling you, if you lean into your savior, you come to him, man, he will pour his life into you. And you'll be seen completely different. You'll be thinking completely different. You'll be transformed because he will do that work that only he can do. But I tell you what, it's that step of faith of God, I need you. When you lean in, man, it's awesome. It's awesome. Jesus in Luke 4, <laughs> it's so cool. He stopped after he said the favorable year of the Lord. He stopped and that there is a comma. If you look in your scripture, it says to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. There's a comma there and it says, which ultimately distinguishes his present favor now with his promised future. Let's read the last part of two and finish with three. It says this, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland or a beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. See, this promised future spoken of here, it is revealing that nothing we endure, nothing this side of heaven in this life is forever. How many of you say, yeah, you're not living my life? Come on, seriously, right? There's things that we feel like, man, it feels like eternity, doesn't it? It's not though, it's not. We think it is, it feels like it is, there's a greater life that awaits us with Jesus eternally for those who are saved. See, if you want a reality check, you want a perspective of what really is forever, go to a graveyard. What are you gonna see? A beginning date and an end date. And then what are you gonna see? That whole person's life is represented by that dash. That whole person's life. Nothing's forever. It might feel like it, but it's not. And even more, Jesus has a greater life awaiting for us in the life to come. See, sin, sin is a crime. It's a treason against our holy God and it deserves to be avenged. It does. In fact, when Jesus returns and he's coming, hallelujah, can we say amen to that? Amen. He, he's coming. I say, come Jesus now, come, let's go. I'm ready, let's go. Here's the deal. When he comes back and he returns, guess what? He's not coming as a lamb this time. 
He's coming as a warrior. He's going to come in and he's going to handle business regarding sin, and it will be done. And that is going to be a beautiful, glorious day. Once and for all sin altogether. I love what Guzik brings out. He says, listen, the comma between these two statements, the proclaim, the, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God. Do you realize that comma has stood for over 2,000 plus years? Because the favorable year of the Lord is what we're in now, and the day of vengeance is when he comes back. And it's represented by that little itty bitty comma. As long as the day we have currently, we will be in his present favor. But when he returns, when he comes back, things are going to change. They're going to go from present favor to promised future. And praise God, praise God that he seeks to return to take us to be with him. Isn't it beautiful what he said in John 14, 3? You know the story. Jesus said what? He said, in my father's house, I go to prepare a place for you. Why? Because in my father's house are many rooms. And I'm going there for you. I'm going to make you a spot. And when I come back, yeah, guess what? I'm going to take you to be with me. Can you imagine that? That's crazy. Right? To be with him. Man, where we might be also. Though we have reasons for mourning. Yes, we do. A day is coming when it's going to end. And what does sin cause? Causes mourning and grief, right? It's just, it just the heaviness of life. Christ says, I'm, I'm here to comfort, comfort them. Why do we need comfort and mourning? Because what happens is we get stuck on that loop because Constable says, because we believe that our sins have doomed us somehow, that we're just locked up in them and we can't ever get free of them. And when we start doubting and then God, are you really there? I mean, it just starts a whole train wreck of stuff. Right? And that's not the case. Jesus, upon the cross, paid our, our sin debt with God in full. You know what he said. What did Jesus say? He was hanging on that cross, right? And, and understand something. He, no one took his life. He made a declaration, and then it says he bowed his head, and then he dismissed his spirit. But what were those words that he said? Do you remember? He said, it is finished. It's done. I've done it. And then he bowed his head and released his spirit. Guys, we might feel unworthy. You might even wrestle with that. But you have to come to truth. The truth is what? When you're in him, Jesus forgives and washes you as white as snow completely. Christ will give you beauty. He's going to give you a crown. That's the wonderful thing about it. A crown awaits you, child of God. A crown awaits you instead of the ashes, instead of those things that represent an outward repentance and, and sadness and grief. He says, I'm going to give you a crown, and that crown is coming, and that is coming when we're with him. I don't know if that does something in you. That does something in me. I don't know. That stirs me up. I'm saying, Lord, wow. Totally feel unworthy. But our worth is in him. You know what he's going to give us? He's going to give us an oil of joy. That joy that's inexpressible. The joy that wells up in you that you can't keep contained. The joy that just overflows. He wants you to have that instead of the heaviness. He wants beauty and comfort and restoration. He, sin causes weariness. It, it sucks joy right out of your life. It's a horrible weight, but Christ says what? I give praise and I'm gonna give you praise to well up in you that will be uncontainable because he is powerfully at work within you. Man, there's nothing better than, than when you see God, do something in you. Change the way you think. Change the way you feel. Change the heaviness of life. Change the burdens you carry. When all of those things begin to change, man, it's so amazing. So amazing. His promised future 
in his present favor, what of that? It rests, all of it rests in his seeds of faith growing within each of you. Well, we sang about that. That song was there for a reason. Why? Because we need to understand it's about faith in you growing. Faith in me growing. Not staying the same place a year from now you are right now. We need to be growing, constantly growing in him. Deepening our understanding. And what happens is when faith grows in you, your roots begin to go deep, which what happens is when life comes at you, when the storms come at you, and all of these things are just rushing you, you know what? Because your faith is strong, you are like an oak tree, just planted, man. You're not moving. And that wind's going to blow, and that storm's going to come, but it's not going to knock you over. You're going to endure it with his strength in you. And it's going to give you the ability to overcome what you're facing. You might experience his promise and his favor, and it causes us to be steady and rooted in this way. Mourning, that is despair and misery, is no longer when God brings the beauty and the oil and the joy within our lives and within our perspective. I tell you what, for years, man, I... For years, I saw through the lenses, the lenses of, of my struggles, my sin, my temptations. That I, I lived a long time like that, and I got sick to death of it. And I prayed for years, God, will you free me? Free me. And you know what he did? And I'm telling you, church, now my eyes see differently. And God wants you to see your life differently. He wants to see it through his perspective, through his word, through his promises. He wants you to see your life and you personally through how he views you. I tell you, when we do, the beauty for ashes come and you learn that he is trust worthy and that he is loving and that he is beautiful may we all may you each and every one find freedom and hope and comfort and healing and favor and a promised future and beauty and joy and praise and strength and may each one of you be resolved to be firm in christ the only one to raise from the dead the resurrected Savior, Jesus, who is the author and he is the finisher of our faith and the one that we're to look to. May you experience that today as we celebrate the resurrection Sunday of Jesus Christ. To God and God alone be all glory, all majesty, all dominion, and all power. Amen and amen. amen. He is alive. He is evermore seated right now, waiting to come back. And man, we can trust that and take it all the way to the bank. It is there, and he is waiting to come back for you and for me. Man, may we experience that present favor, and may we eagerly await the promised future. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you and are so thankful for all that you've done, all that you are, and all of who we are in you. Today is a celebration, God. Today, the the weakness of the word thank you doesn't do justice, but God, we just, all we can say is thank you. And Father, may our lives be a living beacon of praise, of adoration and gratefulness. May we lean into you. May we feel your embrace. May we be rooted deep. May our faith grow. And may you and you alone be praised. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Hallelujah. We got a couple announcements for you before you leave and move here. Two things. Uh, we have a fellowship time. So if some of you came a little bit early and experienced it, awesome. Please do me a favor. Let those who haven't arrived yet, let them go through. And then you come and mop clean up. That's okay. We like that. Uh, so please do. Fellowship, we have got all kinds of goodies in there. It's inside the fellowship hall in our kitchen. Second thing, at Christmas, and, in, and we normally put out a, a way for you to take some family pictures, we have something new for you to commemorate this memory of today. We have a wall that's on the opposite side, same place where we put the Christmas one, over there by the coffee. If you turn around and look, there's a green wall. Has, has a, like a, a green grass wall, and on the corner of it, it says beauty for ashes. We encourage you to take some family photos of today, and uh, may God bless you, each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. God bless you. You can come this way too, by the way.